Welcome to See Things Differently, a podcast from Remix Summits in collaboration with our series partner, the UK Government and Time Out. I'm your host, Peter Tullen, and your guide to the future of the creative economy. This podcast is for creatives who want to be creative entrepreneurs. Over the last few years, thousands of delegates to Remix events have gathered in leading creative cities such as London, New York, Sydney and Istanbul to hear from the visionaries behind emerging creative powerhouses such as Meow Wolf, Punch Drunk, Secret Cinema and Team Lab, alongside established names such as Glastonbury, Burning Man and MoMA. I believe we are in the age of the creator. And through See Things Differently, we have another platform to share the stories of the pioneers developing the creative content, products and experiences that are reshaping the economy. I also believe creative entrepreneurs could offer some of the answers to how we can build back better from the global pandemic. Finally, if you like what you hear, there are literally hundreds more talks from Remix events around the globe at remixsummits.com. And better still, many of them are free. So what's not to like? Pip Jamieson was named in the Sunday Times Top 100 Disruptive Entrepreneurs and was also named as one of the inspiring 50 Top 50 Women in Technology in the UK. She is the founder and CEO of The Dots, which is a professional network for creatives, or as they put it themselves, for people who don't wear suits to work. It has been dubbed the next LinkedIn by Forbes, and it could probably be best described as a LinkedIn for creatives. The Dots already has over 500,000 members and has raised nearly £10 million in venture capital funding. Pip has put promoting social responsibility and helping businesses build diverse teams at the heart of everything they do. 68% of the DOTS community is female, 31% are black and minority ethnic, and 16% are LGBT+. Her background includes time working for the Brit Awards, then also as head of business strategy for MTV in Australia. She is a serial creative entrepreneur, and in 2009 she launched The Loop in Australia, a visual networking platform that was used by 67% of Australian professionals. All right, Pip, uh, welcome to See Things Differently. It's really fantastic to have you um, on the pod. Um, Now, I'm going to start, I think, by just understanding a bit about your journey prior to setting uh, up the dots. So could you tell me a bit about that, you you know, your your background and some of the influences that have kind of led you down the pathway that you've followed, please? Yeah, so, um, well, I mean, I have to go way back in history, I guess. Um, So uh, I'm very dyslexic, so I really struggled in school, um, particularly in those kind of seven to eight years where you kind of fall massively behind. And to be honest, no one ever thought I'd even finish school, let alone go to uni. I was, um, none of my family had ever been to uni. Um, But by sheer miracle, I managed to get myself to university. Um, I went to Edinburgh and I actually studied maths and economics. Um, And I guess a huge part of when I left uni is I really just wanted to make the world a little better than I found it. So I thought a way to do that is uh, my first role is I uh, was an economic um, on the economic fast stream for the British government here in the UK. Uh, and working on economic policy. Um, However, I'm way too impatient as most entrepreneurs are. And I realized to have an impact in government, I probably have to stay there for about 20 to 30 years. So I jumped ship and joined the- That was was never the job for you. That was too much of a, (laughs) too much of a long ask. So um, I jumped ship and uh, joined the creative industry. So I was working for the Brit Awards in London, uh, then for MTV in various roles around the world, including in Australia. And I started MTV in uh, New Zealand. And it was really while I was working that I realized that there was no professional networking solution that was built for a modern workforce. So really when Mm. it comes to professional networking, you got LinkedIn. And LinkedIn has been completely engineered for a very corporate, a very homogenous 
um, workforce. And I was surrounded with people that were working in an incredibly different way. You know, loads of my friends were starting businesses, side hustles. They were freelancing. They were having a much more fluid way of work. Um, and I guess on a deeper level, um, I just felt that LinkedIn wasn't a place for me, that I had to be this homogenous suited person to succeed. And that isn't the modern way of work. It's our differences that make us brilliant. So I wanted to create somewhat naively, you know, I was that naive founder who goes, you know what, I just, I can invent a better solution than LinkedIn. And I guess the rest, as they say, is history. So you know, a big difference between us and LinkedIn, for example, is our community is incredibly diverse. So um, we're over a million members now, 68% um, of those are female, over 31% ethnic minority. We do a lot of work supporting socioeconomic movement, uh, neurodiverse talent, and um, and uh, highlighting amazing LGBT plus talent, for example. Um, but I think at the heart of everything we've created is a really kind and inclusive platform, which is really what the world needs right now, based on what's happening with Facebook and everything like that. So our algorithm is actually the based good guys. on positive. We're the good guys. <laughs> so our algorithm is based on positivity and kindness. So the kinder you are to the community and the more you give to other people in the community, the higher you come up in search results. And it's just led to this really productive, kind, collaborative environment where anyone, no matter what your background can kind of succeed and I guess find your career aspirations and, and rise to the top. And so it's been a magic, a magic sort of journey watching that progress over the years. No, oh, um, if all algorithms were like that, we definitely wouldn't have anything to fear from the robots, would we? I mean, you know, that's uh, <laughs> that's that's, that, that's no, amazing. No, definitely not, unfortunately. <laughs> so, so maybe this is a good point to, you know, sort of fast forward. Um, and look, we 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 met um, when you were in obviously Australia originally. I think at a rather fabulous bar on Bondi Beach, and all of this reminds me again of how the world used to you be, you know. Um, but then the next time we kind of caught up was when you found yourself in in London uh, in a little warehouse. You know, the Remix team were in uh, over in um, in East London, and. So you're, you're sort of setting up the dots and can we maybe delve a bit more into the, the problem you were trying to solve there in terms of connecting, you know, creatives and perhaps you could talk a bit more about that and, and a bit more about the platform. Yeah, so I guess a huge problem is that LinkedIn is very geared around an individualistic experience. And what I mean by that is you promote yourself via a CV and that is look at what I've done individually. The way the dots works is people post projects and credit the full team around those projects. And I guess it's a recognition that, you know, the modern workforce is, is collaborative. There is no project or startup or anything that's ever been cre created that hasn't been a team endeavor. So while our genesis is very, or our, yeah, our genesis is very much the creative industries, our community aren't just creative, it's the full team that deliver on a project. So for example, someone can put up an app and uh, tag the, this is the front end engineer, this is the back end engineer, this is the head of data, this is the head of product, this is the UI designer. Um, so it's a very different way of promoting yourself and crediting the full team around it. But I guess everything that I found problematic with, say, platforms like LinkedIn was very much that it was, hey, look at me. It was more like a media site, right? I just, I'm so honored that I won this award. Or, hey, aren't I incredible? And look at my brilliant blog post on tips, even though I've never actually lived through that problem. So the way we've engineered the platform is very much around people supporting each other around topics or problems they have. So I guess the beating heart of the dots is our forum where someone will put up anything from I'm struggling to work remote. Can people give me tips 
or I have, you know, autism, has anyone got an advice or groups that I can form? Um, and heartbreakingly through COVID, a lot of people obviously saying that they were either made redundant or furloughed and how to manage that. So it's a very collaborative experience as opposed to a uh, kind of ego beating experience, which is what you get on LinkedIn. And I guess what is so lovely about that is that anyone from any background can come to the dots, not know something, and the community is there to support them on their journey and get shit done. Um, and yeah, it's it's not the ego driven crap you get elsewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, amazing. So, so, so you've built this supportive community of, of a million people. I mean, it's incredibly impressive. And like I said, I remember Pip arriving, you know, there was just you and your Mac, you know, it's a classic entrepreneur story, isn't it? And like, like, how did you get from like that to where you are now? Because it's like I say, it's, it's it's just such an incredible thing, you know, for other entrepreneurs, I guess, listening to this to go from that to, you know, this obviously this this story of how you've, you know, built a platform with, with that number of people that look to it, as you say, as a, as a, a, a platform that they want to be a part of. Yeah, I mean, hey, you know the drill, Peter, like starting <laughs> a business is the most insane roller coaster ride of highs and lows, you know. I had, so I, I have no tech background. I've had to learn everything from scratch. I've made some amazing successes, but also I've obviously made some massive mistakes along the way as well. I think the reality is, is that I always had a really strong purpose and vision. Um, and, you know, that was to democratize opportunities and that has never changed. And that's kind of what mm -hmm. gets me out of bed. But the product itself has evolved massively over the years, really just listening to the community's needs and how we can help them most. And so I think sometimes and, I, you know, I mentor so many founders these days. And I think, you know, sometimes it's just about putting one foot in front of the other and just getting it started and learning as you go along um and you know it's a lot of hard graft you know i work insane hours um i work six days a week i've had maybe a holiday since i started the dart <laughs> um uh, but most importantly i've surrounded myself with brilliant absolutely brilliant people who complement my skills and all my weaknesses, they're brilliant at. And uh, so, yeah, that's kind of been fundamental to the journey, but it's a roller coaster ride. <laughs> Look, it's your, it's your second time around the block as a founder. And I think that's really interesting when you talk to, you know, there's two types that kind of serial entrepreneur, I'm going to call you a serial entrepreneur now. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you, but you've grown, you've grown other, other businesses. And, 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 and obviously you've, you've been in leadership roles you know you, you you know you've worked at a senior level in, in the creative industries and and like what, what did you take from those previous experiences yeah i mean so many i mean you know my first startup um i started in australia it was a bit like a baby sister version of the dots called the loop um and i made all of the rookie mistakes that you can make when starting uh, a business um and i mean one of those is that you know i started it with a co-founder we had very complementary skills different visions and so that that relationship ended up not working out so i had to exit my previous business and start from scratch over here in the uk and i think in terms of kind of key learnings i've learned is that you know one um you know, co-founders are brilliant, but I am now a sole, sole founder. I think if you have a mm. co-founder relationship, making sure that you have very different skill sets, the same vision, same work ethic, all of that is really important. Um, if you work with someone who's just like you, that's where the conflict tends to happen. So that was a kind of a big mm. learning from me. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, the, the one of the hardest things obviously I've ever had to do is raise multiple rounds of investment. So just to put it in context here in the UK, only 8% of angel funding goes to female founders and only about 2.3% of funding at my level goes to female founders. So that's been a massive roller coaster ride for me, a massive learning curve for me on how to sort of um, succeed as a female entrepreneur in still what is unfortunately a very masculine industry, which is changing. But yeah, that's been a that's been a 
constant learning curve, I think. Yeah, look, I think that's a really key point because, you know, as we both know, the tech world, it's still a very male dominated uh, industry. And as you say, that's reflected in, in founders. And there's, so I maybe want to sort of pick up on that. And that, look, the, the dots has always had this strong focus on diversity. And could you tell me a bit more about that and how perhaps you see the dots as being perhaps part of the, the solution to that? And that, you know, obviously that's potentially also based on some of your own experiences that you've talked about earlier, being a female founder and, you know, dyslexia, those, those sorts of things. Yeah, I mean, the reality is if we are creating products and services with homogenous teams, we're building things for ourselves and not for everyone. And this is really the kind of root cause of a lot of the problems we're having in the diversity and inclusion space right now. Um, unless you have a team that reflects society, you're not going to pick up the challenges that your business is, is, is or the problems you're causing for, for a more inclusive world. Um, I'll give you an example. For example, when um, seat belts were designed, they were designed by a homogenous masculine team. So while women were more likely, uh, were less likely to have road accidents, they were actually more likely to die in those accidents because of the way they were designed and crushing on the pelvis. That's a very extreme example. But the thing is, is if we don't have teams that reflect, this is the sort of things we're perpetuating. Like the amount of times I've had a fight with Alexa because she listens to my husband more than she listens to me. So, I mean, that's because, you know, Alexa has been engineered by a, a kind of a mainly homogenous team again. And so all of these small things that we are doing, you know, we could really solve a lot of the inclusion challenges we're having if we really, you know, laser focus on teams that reflect society. And when I talk about teams that reflect society, that is not just gender. Um, mm. diversity is intersectional. So that is everything from disabilities, um, ethnicity, um, uh, nationality, sexuality, um, socioeconomic movement. I mean, actually, we could end up with teams that all look very diverse. But if there's no one that hasn't been to university, that's not diverse. So mm. I think, you know, in, and that's really at the heart of why we created a positive kind and inclusive platform that has then led to a diverse platform that then means that companies and individuals who use us to hire are always connecting with brilliant, diverse, hungry talent and not that kind of the old guard, which is what LinkedIn's algorithms are based on. So I want to talk a little bit about the fact, so you've, um, you know, you've built this wonderfully inclusive platform, but as People often say there's a difference between that kind of startup phase, as you say. Well, I mean, it's, it's all hands to the pump. It sounds like regardless, but it's there's there's different, I guess, uh, qualities or characteristics in a kind of startup phase to, I guess, what people talk about the kind of you know the stay stay up or the kind of scale up phase. And I wondered, um, you know, how did you go about that second part of the journey? And again, are there lessons that you would you would share from from that? Yeah, I mean, interestingly, you should never lose your startup grit, I think. Um, and the way we manage that is we work off OKRs, but we actually split them into core and explore. So the core ones is essentially the scale up part of the business. It's the side that has complete product market fit that we know really well that we can kind of lean into, improve and iterate. Um, and that's the bit you kind of scale because there's a proven kind of, I guess, um, roadmap to scale. However, we do still at the dots have a part which is called explore. So this is, I guess, our innovation team that's constantly improving, changing, testing new things, iterating new things. And that's kind of how we've managed that two sides of the business. I guess on the scale up, you know, side, I think, you know, it's very much about having a team that a whole different type of team and a different type of expertise you know the explorers are very kind of iterative scrappy they don't care about code quality you know they just put things up take it down you know it's just get out there and test things you know when you come to the scale up side which is the core side you know this is people that are more senior have um you know actual expertise in previous business on scaling those kind of businesses and that's kind of how we split 
the two. I did find it fundamentally important and much easier running the scale up side here in the UK. Um, mm. The reason being is I found that Australia was great for the scrappy explore side because it was somewhere that I could test and iterate things very quickly. But on the core side over here, there is a, uh, I guess, a much more mature ecosystem um, where you have second and sometimes third generation founders. You have access to a wealth of kind of consultants and people who have worked at some of the biggest companies in the world. So, you know, we work with people who are in the original team of Instagram and Facebook, for example, and then mm. just access to capital and the way wealth of knowledge that comes from that capital. And that wasn't something that I had in Australia. I will caveat that by saying it's been a while since I left Australia. <laughs> so maybe the, the ecosystem has changed. But I think for that scale up journey, I found that being based in London was is was incredibly fundamental to that journey. Um, and I personally would rather die than being based in the San Fran. It's one of the most awful places I've ever been in my life. So um, and funnily enough, I feel like San Fran is a bit like the old guard. That's how they used to build tech. What I love about the UK tech ecosystem is it's a very collaborative, very kind, um, but also way more ethical than I experience when I'm over in the US. Yeah. Oh, that's a really interesting point, isn't it? Because look, I, I know with my remix sound, we, we find cities like London or Berlin or New York exciting because also they're about more than just the tech ecosystem. And obviously you're a great example because you're about the creative industries, technology or everything. But, you know, for me, those cities are exciting because they're about creative people. And then, you know, how you literally join the dots to, you know, to, to take your words to, you know, make exciting things happen. So, so yeah, I, I, just to delve a bit more in, into the, the UK, I mean, what, um, yeah, be, yeah, being in that, that ecosystem, it's, it's fascinating because most people would say, yeah, you need to go to Silicon Valley to, you know, eventually to be able to kind of build something of, of, of Google S scale or LinkedIn, if that's what you're, you're, I know that's not your aspiration, you're trying to be the, the opposite to something like LinkedIn. But um, yeah, look, talk to me a bit more about the UK, UK ecosystem and maybe how you see that developing and why, you know, both from the creative industry side and technology, because you're both, aren't you, I guess? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely both. And actually, a lot of our community and clients on the dots are also tech. You know, I very much see mm. tech as a creative discipline. I think the only industry we don't really look after on on the dots is things like, you know, blue collar working and then obviously finance. Um, but I think um, in terms of, well, one, I, I found um, a really soft landing here. Um, you know, the we were supported by London partners. They sort of helped mm. with a lot of introductions when I first arrived. I think I actually met you through them, Peter. I think when you, you would, anyway, but they helped connect a lot of dots because I had been out of the country for 10 years. I had no little black book. So basically I just gave them a little black book of people I was trying to get in touch with and they kind of helped with C-suite introductions. So that helped really in the early stage. I think as sort of I evolved through the industry, um, I found some of they've got an amazing pro, uh, program that helps um, entrepreneurs if they're exploring going to different countries, going over there and sort of. Um, so I was part of a cohort that spent time in Silicon Valley, which is basically when I decided there was no way I wanted to w work and live in Silicon Valley. Um, but I think the ecosystem as a whole is just very collaborative and very well set up. So I'm part of a, a couple of really kind of. Um, uh, I guess, influential um, uh, scale-up groups. One's called ICE, which is all founders that are like Series A or above. And it's a mm. network that's really geared to sort of supercharge and get advice from other people. And the network I found invaluable, like, you know, you, there's one degree of separation to any investor you want to get in touch with, um, any advice on policies, anything that you basically need, someone in that network can help and um that's an amazing power and powerful part and it's because you know they are a lot of second generation entrepreneurs that are there as well so they've kind of lived it and you know when it comes to founding businesses we all go through the same shit just at different times <laughs> so if we can share each other's learnings and find an easier path um then it's a it's a wonderful place to be as well <laughs> 
I just wanted to take a few moments to talk about our latest remix collaborator, the UK government, who are the series partner for See Things Differently. To celebrate this link up over the next few episodes, we're going to be exploring the stories of a number of UK based innovators. I'm also excited about this collaboration because the first ever Remix Summit took place in the UK in London back in 2014. 300 creatives gathered from sectors such as the arts and technology at Bloomberg's European headquarters in the heart of the city to explore the future of the creative industries, creative cities and the creative economy. Remix was designed to be a platform that would bring together creative thinkers from different industries to connect and develop new ideas. I believe that one way to spark innovation comes from the meeting of diverse minds. I think of these melting pots as the collision economy. They create an environment where you can see things differently. This collision effect is most powerful in locations where there is a large creative ecosystem and talent base in countries such as the UK. For example, did you know that the UK is ranked fourth in the world in the Global Innovation Index? There's over a hundred tech unicorns, that's companies with a valuation over a billion dollars in the UK, which was the third country to pass this milestone. It also ranks number three in terms of venture capital investment globally. If you're interested in finding out more about doing business in the UK, then visit Great gov.uk forward slash remix to find out more. Now back to the show. Look, I want to move on now to um, COVID. And look, could you talk to me a little bit about your experience during COVID? And we've asked this question of everybody and it's For some people, it was like, you know, cataclysmic impacts. I think we were talking before our chat, you know, if you're you're running time out and your your whole business is about helping people to go out, like what what the hell do you do when, you know, people can't go out anymore? So I'm interested in, you know, what's been the impact on on your business? Did it require you to pivot at all or to work with your stakeholders in, in new ways? Yeah, I mean, we were the story of two halves. You know, we are a platform that was built for the future of work and the future just arrived a lot faster than we thought it was going to. So it was this insane time where suddenly the the world locked down and suddenly we had a platform that helped people who were going through kind of professional challenges or trying to pivot their career and everyone was going through challenges, pivoting their career, looking for you know new opportunities. Um, uh, 41% of our community are freelance. So we got very early warnings because they were the first mm. to be let go and their contracts were kind of canceled early on. Um, and so in terms of like growth engagement just went through the roof. Um, We had to make a few pivots on the product side. So for example, um, we have a event section where we work with, you know, thousands of companies that promote professional events through the dots, like, you know, Google or Apple. Um, We had to move that whole tech virtual. So it was virtual events, not in person, obviously, but we did that within like three days. Um, We also just had so much really quite heartbreaking questions hitting our forum that we basically scaled up a kind of army of mentors that were all helping answer questions who are senior leaders who are in a privileged position still had jobs and were able to give back to the next generation so it it more led to product innovation and then what was interesting about that was the growth and the scale we then got on an international level because prior to that a lot of the opportunities a lot of the events a lot of the collaborations were locally based so suddenly it was much more accessible to an international market because you know professional events were virtual collabs were virtual so that was really interesting the other half though which was horrific is that we make money through recruitment So while about 60% of our revenue, so we don't do recruitment ourselves, companies pay us a monthly fee to hire through the site. So while 60% of our clients were subscriptions, luckily they stayed through 40% is um, ad hoc hires. um, And that literally disappeared overnight. So I had this crazy challenge of a a exploding platform while simultaneously (laughs) 
<laughs> I was dealing with um, less cash flow, which is never great for a founder. Um, so actually what that led to is um, we started getting approached by businesses that had offline communities, professional communities like the Soho House Group who Hi. wanted to bring yeah. their community together. And they were like, you know, this is the modern world. Don't build the tech yourself if you're a corporate. It's ridiculous. Other people have built it. Um, so, yeah, we started getting approached by companies saying we want to build a professional networking solution for our communities. Can we license your tech? So that's basically what we started to do. So we started licensing our tech and it's um, it's been amazing. It's one of those things where I probably wouldn't have pivoted revenue model if it wasn't for the fact my other revenue model was going down. But it's been the best thing I've ever done because I've never made so much money in my life. I'm like, why didn't I do this years ago? This is a way easier business model than talking to talent managers and companies. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of where the, the business led. And it's um, it's been magical to I guess it's magical when you build something that is so well engaged with and loved by your own community. But to be able to then give that same technology to other companies is wonderful because it's sort of just, it's naturally scaling the mm. tech you've built beyond on your own community. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a fun journey. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's a real validation, isn't it? And what you built and yeah, it's interesting. I think those moments of crisis, I mean, yeah, to finish the time out. So, I mean, it's, it's, often people say it's, you know, it's the mother of invention, isn't it? So for, for them that became, you know, time in and, you know, uh, this, this, this pivot, I guess, led them down some new avenues and to think differently about what, what they were doing, I guess. Um, so I, I, think I, I wonder... Oh, sorry, Peter. Yeah, sorry. I think what's no, no, interesting go, go. as well is sometimes it's timing as well because we had, you know, obviously people are looking for a solution to bring their communities together, but two other things that are happening simultaneously is Black Lives Matter and everyone mm. wanting to build more inclusive communities. And then simultaneously... You've also got the massive backlash to social media like Facebook based on negativity and ethics. And suddenly we were kind of caught in the eye of storm of people were like, I want a community solution. I want an ethical one. I want a diverse one. And we brought those three together. And I think the other sort of really fascinating thing is everyone has been talking about community like I'm going to build a load of followers on Insta and that's a community. That is not a community. That's you broadcasting to your followers. And also you're having to pay <laughs> to broadcast to your followers. And I think all yeah, these companies yeah. and brands are like, this is ridiculous. We're, this is our community. We've built it up. We can't even reach our community unless we pay Facebook anymore. There's got to be a better way to actually mobilize a community to come together, be able to communicate with that community without kind of selling your soul to the Insta Facebook algorithm. Um, and so, yeah, it's sort of those things coming together, which is always really fun when you're an innovator to kind of connect, connect the dots. <laughs> yeah. So you're really, in that sense, you're really helping people build communities in a, in a new way, which I think is, um, I mean, you talked about, so you're looking to have a, a positive impact on the world. And, and actually if I, you know, reflect on that and say the arts world, if I look at like the rise of collectives, you know, where people are doing amazing things where individually they might not be able to do them by themselves, might not have the resources or the skills, but a group, I think like Mia Wolf being a fantastic example, or members in Indonesia, like Ruin Grouper, where, you know, with scarce resources, they were just able to do incredible things by working together in a positive way. So, yeah, I think for me, hopefully that's one of the things that's starting to come out of the pandemic. And it's also just realizing we need community more than ever before, whether that's online or, or, or offline. Um, yeah, that's super interesting. So um, I, I maybe want to sort of stay just a little bit with with, with pivots, because of course, I think, you know, you're a great champion of the creative community. Those are, that's your, your tribe within the dots. And did, did you see similar pivots within that community as well? I guess you had a bird's eye view of some of the things that were happening and like, what were the opportunities, the challenges that the creative community were facing during that period? And with the moments of enlightenment and um, you just, just great ideas that came out with your community as well? 
Yeah, I mean, so many. I mean, in terms of the great pivots that are going on in terms of the creator community, I think you just nailed one, which is the rise of collective, the death of advertising industry and how brands are more likely to work directly with creators now Mm -hmm. Um, and just the creator economy. You know, you can now be a creator for different platforms and make a living from that and be a creator within that space. And I will say, though, creativity, when I define creativity, is very broad. It's a human trait. We're all creative. I think it's the accessibility of creativity as well. Before it was like you had to study fine art or you had to study design to be a creative. Now, really, it's it's more human instinct. If you create content that is interesting, that you are a creator you don't need to have a actual creative discipline i guess or a creative education to so that accessibility is is kind of being magical i mean on a kind of a more job side i mean you know tech's going through the roof right and so mm what we're seeing is a huge amount of what you'd say traditional creators moving into the tech space in one way or another. Again, you don't have to have a computer science degree to work in tech. You can be a content creator in tech. You can be a copywriter in tech. You can be a, you know, a UI UX designer instead of a graphic designer. So I think that, you know, tech is just becoming, uh, I guess, embedded into a lot of the skills that Mm. we need um and again not that you have to learn to code but you know great work is coming out of collaborations between for example engineers and creators so there's a lot of that um i think a huge also we saw just a massive rise in starting businesses side hustles because you know you are on here in the UK furlough or you've been made redundant and people are looking for different ways. And I, I get really excited by that as an entrepreneur myself, Mm. Um, you know, just seeing like, you know, why would I work for a corporation? And there's that, you know, there's less of an appetite these days to work for the corporate, you know, why don't we start our own thing? And, um, and whether that's a side hustle, freelancer, sole entrepreneur, like that there's always these amazing opportunities i think the other thing coupled is obviously a lot of our community is driven by social purpose so we've just seen a huge rise in everything environmental you know Mm. brilliant sustainability businesses loads of projects around cop we've had loads of our community at cop um and i think there's that now you know what i love about the creative is we naturally see problems and want to design solutions around those problems. And that's kind of what we're seeing a lot on the dots as people are trying to make the world a little better than they found it, which is great. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's fascinating and heartening and in equal measure. Um, so uh, with, within some of those trends, actually, I wanted to talk a bit about um, geography. So you, you let it slip that you're now living the dream in your country cottage in Kent, but also living in London as well. And, and for me, that feels like another shift that's come out of the pandemic that, you know, flexible work wasn't here before. We know it was quite a big thing in, in, in the tech world. It's, it's definitely here now, isn't it? And so I think lots of um, entrepreneurs are, are appearing where people are, as you say, are, are trying different things, whether... Um, by desire or just or sort of forced in, in, into doing something different. And and I think geography is it's a similar thing that's happening. And I wonder, like, I guess, like with something like the dots, was it, would a lot of your membership have been focused on like big creative cities like like London? I know yeah, obviously there are other major cities in the UK where you've got, you know, decent sized creative populations as well. Is there a bit of a spread happening now? Is that all just up in the air? Yeah, I mean, definitely a spread. I mean, time's going to tell, right? Um, I mean, we're a remote first company now. So um, the reason I did that, actually, is I surveyed the team and the majority of my team are engineers and they just prefer working from home. And um, so we have co-working membership in London for any of the team that want to kind of go in and have Wi-Fi and get away from their homes, which I think is really important for especially juniors because it can be tough working from home if you're working in a big shared apartment. 
but that's definitely a massive trend um you know, I was mm. saying, you know, I'm what you call a twat now. So I work in London Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. Um, so I have a houseboat in London. We have co-working space. Um, but on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, I'm now in Kent. Loads of my team have moved all over the world. I think that, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday f- um, working is definitely here to stay. Um, What I love about it is the inclusivity and the accessibility that it gives. If you're a carer, if you're a parent, you know, you don't have to deal with uh, London um, prices so much or train fares as much. Um, There's definitely, you know, some industries that want to go back. um, But to be honest, those are the more sort of traditional industries like finance that we're finding here in the UK. Um, I think this whole new world is just magical. It just makes it just so much more accessible to everyone, no matter where you're from and long may it last, but time will tell. (laughs) Yeah. Do you think anything, I mean, obviously you're an example of a creative community that exists online and obviously offline as, as well, but you know, we would, when we talk about cities like London, we often thought that proximity was a big driver, wasn't it? Of new ideas and, and collaborations and, you know, that you, just lifestyle, everything about it was you wanted to be in this buzzy place where you would, as you talked about, you bump into these, these people from different industries. And do you think we'll, we'll lose some of it, or is that an area where the dots can help fill a void if people are living these slightly different lives? That's exactly the void we're filling. It's like the dots has now become the water cooling place, the water cooler, Mm -hmm. I guess. And it's very much around, you know, bumping into people, discussing topics, hearing things that are going on. And I think what's interesting is now licensing our software is, you know, they've just taken our kind of mass water cooler kind of technology and they're now using it for their own members and their own organizations. Um, don't get me wrong. I, I mean, I love going into the co-working space every now and again, but like there's so much you can recreate virtually. I mean, it was so funny. We did a, um, we did like a brainstorming session with post-it notes and the team recently. And I forgot what a pain in the ass it is once the post-it notes are on the wall to actually have to capture them way better using Miro. So yeah, I think people who are doing it well are still remembering that team cohesion is important. So you know, they're doing, say, you know, quarterly big away days where it's two days that the whole team goes away. So you get that kind of team bonding and that cohesion. Mm. But, you know, doing a lot of stuff remote, which is actually means you're tapping into a wealth of people from all over the world, not just the people that you sit next to at a desk. You know, I think it's um, there's a lot more wealth of knowledge that you can get with a kind of a more um, decentralized uh, organization but yeah again I guess time will I'm, tell <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling like this is where I should definitely ask you about Mr Zuckerberg and the metaverse because you know this is his <laughs> dream isn't it you know <laughs> do not get me started on that delusional <laughs> twat <laughs> yeah I mean I, I think this is this sums up why I went to the valley which I've been to the valley like four times now and decided that it was the probably the most awful place to start a business um the reason being in the valley you know it is in the middle of nowhere like there's these huge campuses that aren't connected to the world and they're not connected Mm. to real life problems it's like these strange environments um and i think what's happening right now is a complete symptom of that you know if you are not connected to um people with different backgrounds if you're not connected to real world problems if you live in this crazy campus vacuum you're going to start building stuff like mark and i guess that's what i love about london it's a living breathing city all the tech organizations are in the heart of the city connected Mm. to all the real world problems that people have every day as opposed to in the valley where you're in these crazy campuses in the middle of nowhere, you're having to travel two hours back and forth to get, if you're living in San Fran. I mean, San Fran, I mean, my God, there's so much homelessness in San Fran. It just makes me sick. You're like, this is the richest country, like richest city, 
pretty much in the world and you have so many people on the on the street your roads are disgusting yeah. your um airports are like third world airports 20 years ago i mean the lack of investment in society and this again is these billionaires in these campuses not actually really thinking about the world i mean the fact that elon musk cares more about space than saving this planet makes me sick um the fact that you know bezos was like when he sort of stepped out away a bit he was like i'm going to do two things i'm going to explore space and i'm going to invest in the environment i'm like is that just your offset scheme you know like just but the, the, this is a symptom of building businesses out of the valley you're building businesses for egos and for with no connection to real world problems and that's why i love the uk because people are actually connected to real world problems and i also love that it's becoming more accessible to anyone in the world to be an entrepreneur wherever you are um you shouldn't have to be based in the valley or the uk definitely don't go to the valley you'll just build some disgusting product that will make the world a worse place sorry i might yeah. be a bit too passionate no no no, about no, I, no, no, no I agree <laughs> I, look, I, I agree, and I think, look, for, for me, business is changing anyway, and I think we're, we're seeing more and more entrepreneurs that obviously, as you say, have a, a social conscience. They're looking to biz, build businesses, whether it's in, you know, climate or, or social areas, whatever it might be, and I think um, that then puts pressure on the existing businesses to also have to change as well because, the you know, the, the, the new challenges are, are, have these things at, at their core. They're, look, they're about more than just money, aren't they? So I think, um, yeah, it'd be fascinating to see how things develop over, over the next few years. So, so to finish, look, I, I just wanted to ask, like, what else does the future hold for the dots? Um, you know, what does success look like? Where does it go next? Oh, do you know what? It's, I, I always get scared when I get asked this question because there's a line you're meant to tell your investors, the, the line that you live by. Um, so as you can tell, I'm very candid. Um, the reality for me is I didn't go into this to, for an exit. Um, I literally went in the, into this to, you know, democratize opportunities and just leave the world a little better behind than I found it. So for me, as long as I'm kind of sticking to that mission, like I'm going to keep driving, driving this through, um, you know, I would say I think I definitely want to be more global than we are. That growth came mm -hmm obviously during COVID, but to really live by our vision of accessibility and inclusion, that is more than like our, our central hub is still pretty much Europe. Um, so I would love to be expanding, but not necessarily in the ways that traditional tech companies think about expanding. It's about the community expansion to be, I want my community to also reflect society, but the global society um not just the core epicenters um and yeah I, d I mean beyond that like i don't have any sort of you know exit plans or aspirations for that yet sorry shareholders <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> i just want to keep building a brilliant business that helps people and and keep keep plowing through on on that journey and uh yeah, that's kind of where I want to go. Yeah, well, look, that's a that's a pretty good point to end on, I think. And look, uh, look, I'm really excited to see where you go next. Uh, it's been an incredible journey so far, and um, just remains for me to say thanks for for joining us and and taking the the time to uh, yeah on, on the pod. So thanks, Pip. It's been a pleasure. So thanks for staying with us, and that's a wrap for this episode. Another great guest will follow in our next edition. I'm Peter Tolan, and if you like what you hear, there are literally hundreds more talks from Remix events all around the globe at remixsummits.com. And as mentioned, many of them are free. If you want to support Remix, then you can subscribe to access all of our latest and upcoming talks from Remix events. And if you're in Australia, our next Remix Summit takes place in Sydney on the 8th to 9th of March. Thanks for joining us.